Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby, and I am here with the newly minted Tony nominee, Sharon D. Clark, for Carolina Change. Um, congrats on this nomination. Uh, it's your first time here on Broadway. You have a nomination. What was yesterday like? Walk us through what that experience was yesterday. Yesterday was crazy. I'd, I'd actually arranged to go over to my brother's house. He's a, my best friend and I call him my brother. So me and my wife, we jetted over to Clapham yesterday, drove down and literally as we were unpacking the car and getting into the house, the nomination started. So we, we switched them on and Susie found it. We managed to hear the nomination. So it was like, okay, let's open a bottle and <laughs> let's get the day started. So we started with some what we are now calling the Mellow Monday Martini cocktails, which are lovely. <laughs> oh, I might adopt those. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, um, yeah it's really cool. You know, you have, you have a really great theater career across the pond. Uh, you have won three Olivier Awards. This was, it's pretty insane to make your Broadway debut after already having a, a great career and in this great role uh, of Caroline. Has New York and Broadway lived up to expectations more than lived up like I said it's it's beyond my wildest dreams when when I started with Caroline in Chichester we were just going to do the show in Chichester there was no talk of it going anywhere else so to go from Chichester to Hampstead to the Playhouse in the West End and then to Broadway it's just for me it's the gift that keeps on giving and Broadway the, the whole community was so welcoming and so gracious and so supportive and I just had the best time I living my best life. Absolutely. It's, I mean, what you just described, it's a long time to live with a character and a show. And included in that was the shutdown because of the pandemic. So we waited an additional hmm. good chunk of time, almost two years uh, for you to get to do this on Broadway. How did that, how does spending time with it change your portrayal? Was there one thing that you felt changed over time by the time you got here? Well, I think that being able to live with a character for that time and really being able to get under their skin and get in and around and under and through that wonderful score was, is just a gift, you know, because I could have done it in Chichester and finished after those first six weeks and gone, gosh, if I'd had more time, I could have tried this or I could have tried that or I could have delved into this. And so each journey, each incarnation, with you know different casts that give you different things to play against and help you to find different ways of 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 you know just getting through the character has been an absolute gift and i think i think the shutdown actually helped us as the broadway cast to get an even deeper hold on it i mean when when the shutdown happened we were just about to do our first dress run and so I think that time gave everyone extra time to really get into the material, you know, to get to know the material as well as I did. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because I'd been doing it for so long, but everyone had a chance to just be like, when we came back and we first heard John playing the clarinet as Stuart, the, 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 the time, the, the um, COVID time, had given him the chance to really get into the clarinet again. Do you know what I mean? It was an instrument that, that he played, but it wasn't something that he was playing all the time. So knowing that Roundabout were still championing the show and saying, it doesn't, we don't know when, but it's definitely going to come back. Everyone had that reassurance. So John, when we first heard him on our first run through, it was like, oh my gosh, you couldn't tell him any different from the orchestra. He was, he just upped his game. I also think that having that, that summer of Black Lives Matter movement and how the world was then informed and sat up and listened and you know marches were had and it was a global movement that actually all of that informed the show as well. You know, you kind of think we're telling this story which was written in what, 2003, about 1963. And yet here we were, 2020, 21, being able to really hold that story to the forefront and just ask how much has changed while we're in the middle of the Black, Latter, Black Lives Matter movement. And so I think actually it happening at that point made the show even more timely and more relevant. Yeah. So everything it, in its time, you know? 
Yeah, it was, I, I told Samantha Williams this earlier in the season, but when I saw the show, I overheard a woman next to me because it begins with that uh, Confederate statue. And she said, oh, they must have added this for the revival, but it's actually part of the story. It's actually, it's, it's, it's in the story. And yeah. what Mike had done is that when we started it off in Chichester, that the that whole side of American history is not British history. So what Mike had done was put the Confederate statue at the beginning to give people a context, to give British people a context. But what happened is, is that the week we opened in Chichester was the week of the Charlottesville riots. So it all, everything was just compounded and resonated and, and heightened and just made even more sense. So I think a really smart move from Mike to actually do that. And then for Tony being ever prophetic <laughs> and the whole thing of Charlottesville happening. And so it was in people's um, psyche, it was in their consciousness. Yeah. And one aspect I love of this show, speaking of things being heightened is um, on its surface, it's sort of about, you know, everyday life and almost the mundanity of everyday life. But Caroline really creates her own world for herself down in this basement with the radio and the washer and dryer that come to life. Do, what does that do for you on stage to like exist in a more heightened reality? Well, actually having, having a relationship with the appliances because these are not just things, but we kind of looked at them as like, you know, the ancestors and, and her support system and, you know, uh, her, her honesty system, you know, that would stand up and go, girl, you've gone too far. You know I mean? When she says what she says to Rose and threatens her with the eye, you know, it's, it's the radio that comes alive and says, whoa, you've got to think about what you're doing now. You've got to think about what you're saying, where you're going with this. You're jeopardizing everything with your pride and your anger. And so it, they're, not, they're not just appliances in that way. They, they're bigger. They let the audience know the things that Caroline isn't able to tell them, but the appliances let you know where she's at. And so things like when they're in the basement, there are no windows, it's dark, it's humid, it's hot as hell. So when the dryer comes on, he is her nemesis. He brings her down, makes her thoughts darker and more oppressive and brings her to that that state where she's that self-reflection but kind of an anger as well do you know what I mean a rage mm -hmm. that's boiling so they, they all have their different aspects but for me being able to have a direct relationship with them being able to hear what they're saying that you know that I could then respond and play with them just made everything I know just heightened everything for me as an actor and I was able to then take what they were giving me and internalize it for Caroline. Yeah, and because you're performing on Broadway with a new cast um, for you, were there elements, you know, was there something that one of those actors gave you that made you think about her differently or made you play something All the time. differently? Yeah. All the time, you know, when, when you're given different fees from people, people say things different ways that they affect you in different ways. And what you have to be is willing to play and go with that and not go, well, when I did it before, so-and-so did it like this and I reacted like that. Do you know what I mean? You're in the moment. And so things will come out differently. I, there are things that Casey did that were very different to Lauren, which meant that my Caroline at that point had to react in a different way. And that keeps it fresh for you as an actor. You know, you're always finding something new and you're, you're willing to play and have fun. And, 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 you know, it may not work one night, but then you've got the next night to go, right, let me see how that turns the corner th this evening. You know, and mm -hmm. also what you're getting from the audience, how the audience are reacting to the show. And that's what I love because you can hear the reactions. Audience members often think that we can't see them behind that fourth wall, <laughs> but we can hear them. And so, you know, you can go with the, an audience's emotion and how they're feeling. Yeah. Well, I would love to dive into a, a little bit of Lot's wife because as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the all time great, you know, Broadway or musical theater showstoppers. Um, and it just, you, it just, you know, seems to, it's a song that like utilizes seemingly every inch of your vocal range and abilities. How long did it take to sort of land on the finding the vocal dynamics of that song? Ages. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always say Lot's Wife is an absolute bugger to learn. There are so many twists and turns and tempo changes and genres of music and 
pulling things back and then, you know, retaldoing one time and then cres crescendoing the next time. And it's, it's just, it's this, this, this madness that when you're trying to learn it, you're like, what? It goes from there to there. How, how does that work? But once it's under your skin, it's the most glorious roadmap as to where your character is, what the emotion is, how you're feeling at every last beat of that song. And once it's in, it's just like, you can fly with it, you can soar with it. And everything in the show for Caroline is leading up to that point. So I kind of think if you ride the crest of that emotional wave, by the time you get to Lot's wife, it's just like, it's there. Do you know, I might, I, I kind of felt that I, I didn't have to be going, where am I going emotionally now? What am I doing? I didn't feel that I had to dig that deep because the emotional roadmap was so clear and the music was telling me where I needed to be and where you could pull things back and where you could explode and you know where the rage was and where the hurt was and where the vulnerability was. That was all in the music. Every last little discord and minor chord and you know triplet. And it was just a joy, an absolute joy. It went from being, how am I gonna do this? You've chosen the wrong person. I can't sing this, it's too high. I'm not a soprano, <laughs> I'm a tenor. <laughs> what am I doing up there? To just being able to go, with it. And that's a wonderful place to be. Yeah, it was, I, I mean, it's such an emotional high point. I, she's saying things like, murder me, God. Um, is that, because she's kind of fighting against, she has a odd relationship with change. She's sort of resistant to it, I think. She's not many sort ways. of resistant, she's very resistant. Yeah, is that, is that kind of the moment for you where she makes a switch? She... I think that's the moment where there is the recognition that everything that has befallen her up to this point is taking her to a place and a person that she doesn't want to be. Mm. And it's that recognition of that. And that's where that murder me God comes from. Do you know what I mean? These things that I've said, this, what I've said to this child who I know is grieving, who I know what his pain is. You know what I mean? His mom and my mom died of the same thing. And my mom, Caroline's mum rather, um, did not die very well. You know, and when she's talking to Noah, when they're, they're folding up the, the cloths, the, the, the sheets, what she says to him about death and cancer, you know that her experience of it wasn't very good. And so you, the grieving and the hurt that she then lays on an eight year old boy, is something that she can't forgive herself for because that's, that's all that happened and, and come through pennies, you know, pocket change has changed who she is and her faith is shaken because of this money that the thoughts that it's led her to have, the things that she's thought that she could do. And then to just be for her and Noah to have their hate in that way brought forward because of money. And it just, it's her realization of like, I can't go on like this. Something has to give, but she doesn't know how to. And all she can do is pour that love and that hope into her kids. That's all she can do. It's not gonna change for her. She's not gonna be like Dottie. She's not gonna go to college and learn to read. She's not gonna be able to move on from that job. You know, she's just gonna have to hope that at some point she might get a raise from the $30 a week, but her lot is what her lot is. And it's about her going, okay, head down, get on, better life for the kids. That's how I succeed is better life for the kids. Yeah. Well, and speaking of uh, hearing and feeling audience reactions, I know that line you say to him got a huge reaction. Do you feel that each night when you say it? That was a, 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 real, a real weird place to be. I mean, there would be times when the audience would laugh and I could never understand mm. why the audience would laugh. And we, we had this in, in London as well, in Chichester that you just, if you're watching the story and you're seeing these, these people in such pain, when they say those things to each other, how you can find it funny in any sort of way, how the pain doesn't just hit you and tear out your heart with a knife, would, would just, I never got my head around it. And people would say to me, well, it's nervous laughter. And I, I, I just, I never ever got it. And 
the one time where I felt really hopeful was in Chichester, we had um, a children's matinee. And I think the kids were from around about 10 to 19, somewhere around there. And on that matinee, when Noah said his hate, all the kids went, <gasps> when Caroline said her hate, all the kids went, <gasps> there was no laughter. There was just shock and, you know, empathy. And I was like, that's what we need. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We've got a young audience here who are not afraid to show what their feelings are and don't have to cover it with nervous laughter like adults do. Mm -hmm. We've also had in New York, I was, I was a bit taken aback. On, on two nights, Noah said his hate and a woman screamed anti-Semitism. She literally stood up and went, that's anti-Semitic. And I thought, you haven't heard what Caroline's got to say yet. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then the following night, Caroline said her hate and someone stood up and applauded. And I was just like, God, on two consecutive nights, we've had reactions to this line that are completely blowing my mind with the state of humanity and how people are thinking. <laughs> it was crazy. Wow. Crazy. Wow. So I preferred the silence. Yeah. I prefer silence and I'd prefer to hear a gasp and I'd, pre I'd prefer that people recognize the pain and were able to feel that pain and not have to turn it into laughter to deflect it because the whole show is going feel, feel, feel. Don't deflect, feel it. Yes, very powerfully so. Um... Well, I also want to talk about an, another show with a, with a bit of pain in it because I, I'm excited. You were recently announced that uh, Death of a Salesman is coming to Broadway with Wendell Pierce and Andre De Shields. Uh, you're coming back. Mm -hmm. You've also lived with this play for a bit. Is this something that you enjoy doing? Is is living with these characters for a long time? Never knew that that was going to happen. This this is not <laughs> part of a great plan, Sam. <laughs> In any way, shape or form. When, when Death of a Salesman happened, we knew it was going to go to the Nick Young Vic and we knew it was going to go to the Piccadilly. That was always going to be, that was, the, that was on the cards. There wasn't the talk of Broadway. So for it to actually come and for that to happen is again, another gift that has continued to give. It's really not part of a great plan. I've just been very, very lucky that these two shows have come at this time. To just be given the chance to have my Broadway debut at the top of the year and to be then coming back again within the same year with another American classic is, <laughs> I'm like that, thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel so blessed. Well, we also, uh, us New Yorkers also feel feel blessed. We're glad to have you. Uh, so keep, keep bringing stuff over here. If you do it over <laughs> in London, we, we'd love to have you more. Um, so congrats again on your Tony nomination. Thank Very you. well deserved. Everyone who's watching, subscribe to Gold Derby. Stay with us throughout this Broadway season. Sharon, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, people.